over at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. Tons of great stuff. Great cast of writers. Got previews up for the NASCAR duels tonight. Preview up for the Daytona 500. Preview up for this weekend's UFC event. Preview up for XFL Week 2. We also have daily NBA, NHL, college basketball. We've got soccer, golf, tennis. Tons of stuff going on over at the website. Please make sure you check it all out. And of course, you're going to be rolling out my MLB season win total stuff, my MLB season preview stuff, team futures, player futures, all that kind of thing. That's going to be rolling out next week. The MLB betting guide will come out next week as well. You'll have the individual team previews on the pages over at bangthebook.com. We'll also be putting together a PDF for you. So you'll have it all in one place. You could download that, read that on any one of your devices. I uh, will probably get a PDF up on Amazon as well for your Kindle. So really looking forward to that. I've got two first drafts left to write, then the editing process for those. And of course, doing the team division pennant and individual player futures shortly thereafter. So a lot of information coming your way in that 2020 MLB betting guide. Very proud of the work that I put into it. Hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoy doing it for you. Uh, actually, hopefully you enjoy it more that I enjoy doing it for you. But in any event, that will be rolling out here next week over at bangthebook.com. Finally, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook, BTB and the number 200 is that promo code, 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. Real quickly here, before I dig into the Major League Baseball stuff, like I said, we won't be having Brad Powers uh, at least this week, probably for a few more weeks here at a minimum on our Thursday editions of the show. But I do want to tell you that once we get into the month of March, the month of madness, as I like to call it, with conference tournaments, with March Madness, and obviously the first four days of March Madness, certainly the most interesting and most exciting, we'll probably go to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday shows in the month of March. What that means is that we'll condense our guests a little bit. Some of our Thursday, Friday segments will move into Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. So I'll do that as it fits, as it's convenient for our guests on the show. But we'll probably just be doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday segments and shows. And those probably will end up being a little bit longer than our traditional shows. Because, like I said, I mean, Thursday, Friday, big days for college basketball. A lot of conference tournaments start Wednesday, Thursday. And obviously, you've got that first week of March Madness that goes Thursday, Friday, and then, of course, the following Thursday, Friday. So just want to give you a heads up about that. Obviously, it's still a little bit into the future here. But again, for the month of March, probably looking to go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just about each week. I'm not sure about the first week of the month because we don't have a ton of conference tournaments to worry about early on in the process. But probably that second week of March, or I guess we call it that first full week of March, Uh, We'll probably, I guess it is the second week of March, but we'll probably be going to the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday format. I may do a betters box on Thursdays to get you ready for the Major League Baseball season, which starts on March 26th. But just a heads up, a programming note for you here, and obviously I'll remind you of that as it gets closer. All right, so we talked some Major League Baseball here. We did that on yesterday's show as well with Brian Leonard. And and you know what? Quite frankly here, as we look back at this week on Bang the Book Radio so far, A lot of stuff with long-term, longer-ranging impact. You know, on Tuesdays with Brian Blessing, we talk NASCAR. We talk golf. There's some good value to that a couple days after the show. Same thing with Wednesdays. We talk XFL and golf with Wes Reynolds. Uh, We're talking baseball with Brian Leonard. On Mondays, we do college basketball with Kyle Hunter and try to take more of a week-long view at things. So a good shelf life to a lot of this stuff on Bang the Book Radio these days. So hopefully you've been taking advantage of that. But obviously, this Major League Baseball stuff is going to have a long shelf life, to say the least here. And I do want to focus a little bit more on the Pakoda discussion that we kind of tapped into a little bit on Wednesday with Brian Leonard. And just a reminder that these Pakoda projections coming from Baseball Prospectus are the results of a lot of simulations, a lot of individual player projections that go into the hopper, into the formula, a lot of advanced metrics, a lot of proprietary stuff that Baseball Prospectus has, either behind the paywall or just completely behind the scenes. They put all this stuff together and run these simulations. And then what they do is that they publish the standings 
for the average of all the simulations for each one of these teams. Now, of course, as we know, averages are just that. You know, it's an average of all the different findings that you get. So these teams may go higher or may go lower. So what do these Pakoda projections mean for me? If you're out there trying to handicap season win totals, how should I be evaluating these things? How should I be looking at these things? Well, something that's really cool over at Baseball Prospectus on the page with the Pakoda standings, you can see the distribution of the simulated wins, the distribution of the records. That is what has value to me. I don't care what the average is. I do not care at all whatsoever what Pakoda comes up with as an average. What matters to me is the range of outcomes. Because that's always my goal. With season win totals, it should be your goal across any season win total market. What is the range of outcomes? What is the ceiling and what is the floor? Now, what the Pakoda projections are going to do is that they're going to create this ceiling and this floor for you. And then obviously, the most popular results will kind of be clustered in there. Well, what's nice is that over on the Pakoda standings page, you can see that distribution. You can see where those peaks are. You can see kind of where the starting point and the end point is for each respective team. So as we take a look around here, you know, you see a team like the Tampa Bay Rays where they don't come to a point. They don't have kind of that bell curve format that a lot of these teams have. They kind of go up and then flatten out and then come back down. So what that tells me is that Tampa Bay has a wide range of outcomes because there's not one predominant number or one predominant range within the greater range. You look at a team like Baltimore, for example, right around 62, 63 wins, you see it come to a point. It's very bell curve-like with Baltimore. So what does that tell me? Well, Baltimore's not going to be very good, which we already knew, but that Pakoda, in most of their simulations, projects them for about 100 losses, projects them for about... 62 or 63 wins, which I still think is actually too high. I'll talk more about that in a second. But you have a very well-defined range of likely outcomes based on the Pakoda simulations. As a general rule, and I mentioned this before and I mentioned this yesterday, I generally don't like playing season win totals that are too high or too low. Last year, the Marlins were an exception. Last year, I played the Marlins under 63 and a half. That one came through for us. But that was by and large because of the other four teams in that division, the 76 head-to-head games that the Marlins had to play. The thing is, the Marlins, over most of the first half, were actually on pace to fall right around their season win total line. So you do still need a lot of things to go right or a lot of things to go wrong with these extremes of the win total betting odds market. So that was a scary one for me. I wound up playing it. It did win. But by and large, I don't play a lot of high season win totals. And I don't play a whole lot of low season win totals. Why? Let's look at the New York Yankees. You look at their distribution curve for those Pakoda projections. And for the most part, they're winning 100 or more games in the majority of those simulations. So there's not a whole lot of margin for error with a team like the Yankees. They're deep. They're talented. Their offense is very, very good. They signed Garrett Cole. They upgraded the pitching staff. So for the Yankees here, I just don't see a wide range of outcomes. I see a very high floor and a capped ceiling. Why is the ceiling capped? Well, because you play 162 games, there's only so many of them that you can win, and you're going to lose some. You're going to play some of the better teams around the league. You'll probably go 500 against the elite of the elite. Well, maybe that makes up 30 or 40 losses for you. If that's the case... Well, then what's the point in taking a high season win total where you may need a team to win you 110 games to feel really confident, you know, with that pick that you've made. So it's one of those scenarios where I really do tend to focus on the teams that have a wide range of outcomes. So who are some of those teams? Well, like I mentioned, Tampa Bay, they've really flattened out. There's not a high peak to their curve. They flatten out. So that's a team that Pakoda has a wide range of outcomes for. The Cleveland Indians are another one. Now, their biggest peak was in the 86 range, but there's another spike around 91 to 92 wins, which would put them up with the Minnesota Twins. Now, I do think that the Indians 
have a relatively wide range of outcomes. They've got a pretty high floor because they've got an elite starting rotation and two of the best position players in baseball in Francisco Lindor and Jose Ramirez. So they've got a high floor. But their peak is very different because you've got a team that does have a lackluster offense. They were a league average offense last year. Now the pitching staff on the whole probably winds up being about the same as last season's. They won 93 games last year. But if that offense takes a step back or they run into injuries once again, yeah, they could finish in that 86 range. But you've also got that spike at 91 or 92 wins where maybe their bullpen does hold it together. Maybe their lineup is a little bit better than anticipated, particularly with a guy like Lindor and a guy like Ramirez who battled injuries most of last season. So you see Cleveland with that higher projection at 91 or 92 wins on that distribution of their of these simulated outcomes. So what that tells me is that Cleveland is a team that has a higher ceiling and a higher floor. So those are the types of win totals that I'm looking to play. You got the White Sox. They have a very wide range of outcomes as well. The top of their curve is very very flat. So what that means is that there are a lot of different ways that this season could go and the simulations said as much so when i look at a team like the white Sox, and i look and you know their average was around 83 wins to me i think their ceiling is 85 or 86 wins i don't see enough going right for them that they wind up being a team with a 15 plus win improvement off of last year's results so because they've got this large range of outcomes to me that's a team i want to try to attack that's a team where i feel like i've got the right level of variance to make a concrete decision because that's what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to prey when it comes to the season win total market on uncertainty. I'm looking to prey on variance because I think with the way that I analyze and evaluate major league baseball, I can do a good job projecting these players, projecting these teams, kind of looking at these situations for these respective teams and then using that high variance environment to my advantage. Because the books are going to put up a number that they think balances action as much as possible. I may not agree with that number. I may not agree with the projections that are out there. So I'm going to fire on those teams. And the White Sox here, a team with a large range of outcomes, it makes sense to me to focus in a little bit more on them. San Diego in the National League West is another one of those teams with a very wide range of outcomes. If you look at their distribution, again, there's no peak. There's no apex to their bell curve. It's pretty flat for the most part. So that's a team that could win 90 games. That's a team that could be the National League wildcard. That's also, to me, a team that could win 75 games. So when I get a big range, those are the teams I want to focus in on very closely because I think those are the teams where you get more season win total value. I talked about on yesterday's segment with Brian Leonard that the St. Louis Cardinals almost annually perform near their projections. They are very, very consistent. They're very close to their season win total. They're very close to their Pakoda numbers. They're very consistent. That's just their MO as an organization. Well, this year, Pakoda comes out very, very low with their projections, projecting them to be around a 500 team. And they've got a pretty high season win total in the upper 80s. Is that a team that I want to attack because Pakoda says something different? Not necessarily because you've got a chronic overachiever in the St. Louis Cardinals that no matter what their projections look like, they perform up to a certain level almost every single year. Maybe it's consistency. Maybe it's overachieving. Maybe it's just sustainability, whatever you want to call it. But that's a team that even though their Pakoda projection is very low, I need it proven to me. I need to see them go out there and have a really bad season. You look at the National League Central, and the Reds actually have the highest average projection per Pakoda. The Reds would be their Central Division winner. But as you look a little bit closer at the distribution of those outcomes, the peak for the Cubs is actually higher than the tallest peak for the Reds. And I love the Reds this season, but that's very interesting, especially with what we saw with the Cubs projections here in recent years. So, Again, I don't take these Pakoda standings numbers to mean anything. 
I'm looking for variance. I'm looking for that wide range of outcomes. I'm looking for the opportunity to get a greater edge. There is no edge to me in playing the Dodgers over 103 wins because they're going to be very, very good. And they could be very, very good and still fall short of 103 wins. I don't want to bet on a team where I'm trying to figure out the degree to which they'll be really good or the degree to which they'll be really bad. Because I just don't see a great edge in that department. The edges that I see are with these teams in the middle. With these teams generally in that 75 to 85 win range where there are a lot of things that could go right and they could wind up having a magical season. There are a lot of things that could go wrong and they could completely bottom out. But in a lot of cases, it's going to be some of both. Some things will go right, some things will go wrong. And what I want to try to figure out is which end of the spectrum they're most likely to fall on. And at that point in time, I take that season win total and I'll play it over or I'll play it under. So what Pakoda essentially does for me is it reinforces my thought process on the teams that I think have a wide range of outcomes. And that's what I'm looking at. I do not care that it says the Phillies are going to win 78 games. I do not care that it says that the Yankees are going to win 103 or or whatever it says. I don't care. I want to see what the range is. Because you're going to have a much higher confidence level in saying, yeah, the Dodgers are going to win 105 games than you are in saying, well, the Angels are going to win 86 or 85. Because the Angels, as much as their improvements help with guys like Rendon, and, you know, Justin Upton being back and some of their pitching enhancements, that's still a team that has fallen well short of projections several years in a row. So these are all things that you can factor into the equation. These are all things that I kind of take a look at here from a Major League Baseball standpoint. And this is probably a good time to remind the listeners out there that when I do the betters box every Monday and Thursday over the course of the baseball season, I do make my notes available to the listeners if they're interested. I had a sheet of about 200 people that were on the mailing list for the segment notes last year. If you want to get on that list, adam at bangthebook.com. Send me an email. Tell me you want to be on the list for the betters box notes. I talk about a lot of numbers, a lot of analytics, a lot of advanced concepts, things of that sort. And sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to follow along. So that's why I make my notes available to anybody that wants them. Again, adam at bangthebook.com. And like I said, I'll probably be doing some of these betters box segments on Thursdays as we go through March Madness and, and the month of March. But you know, primarily, we'll be doing them here during the Major League Baseball season, which of course, as we know, begins on March 26th. I mentioned some injury stuff yesterday in the segment with Brian Leonard. I just want to circle back to that a little bit here more. Uh, Just because we've got a couple new injuries, I just want to talk about how I analyze them here in spring training. Yesterday on the show, we mentioned Nicole Hamill's injury. He'll be reevaluated in three weeks. They announced yesterday that he will not be ready for opening day. Had a similar issue last season with that shoulder. But you have to understand here that some injury situations are much worse than others. And obviously, I know that goes without saying. But I'm not just talking about the name recognition of the injured player. And Cole Hamels is obviously a big name. But how much does that hurt the Braves if he misses four, five, six starts, something like that? To me, I don't think it's that much. Because the Braves have a ton of pitching depth. A lot of guys on the fringes in AAA of Bryce Wilson, Atuki Toussaint. Uh, You got a lot of guys in Ian Anderson. A lot of guys that are kind of in that mix anyway. So over the course of a full season, would Cole Hamels be better than those guys? Maybe. It's certainly possible. Over six, seven, eight starts, how much better would Cole Hamels be than those guys? In my estimation, probably not a lot. So you hear this big news of, oh my God, Cole Hamels isn't going to be ready for opening day. It's a bummer. It's, It's a bummer for him. It's a bummer for the Braves who put out good money to sign him for one season. But I don't think the tangible impact is going to be that high. Now, you contrast that with a different situation like James Paxton with the Yankees. James Paxton cleared to throw here in about four to six weeks, puts him in about mid to late March. So, (coughs) excuse me. So he's going to wind up missing most of spring training, if not all of spring training. 
So I put him at another two months probably because he's got to go through the spring training type workload, building his arm up, throwing sim games, throwing rehab starts in the minor leagues. You're probably looking at late May, early June at the earliest for James Paxton. Now, in a vacuum, James Paxton's not that big of a deal because you signed Garrett Cole and you've got some guys like a Davey Garcia, like a Jonathan Loisega, somebody like that, that could step up. But remember, Domingo Herman is suspended. So now the Yankees are down two starters and they get Garrett Cole and they get Luis Severino back, which is obviously a tremendous help for them. But you're talking about probably missing somewhere in the range of 25 starts from James Paxton and Domingo Herman. That's a lot different than missing six starts from Cole Hamels. So does it impact the Yankees' chances of winning the division? Probably not that much. Does it impact my desire to play a season win total over 100? Absolutely. Because what happens is it lowers the ceiling for that team. They can out hit anybody they want, and they've got an elite bullpen, and we may end up seeing the opener concept from them early on in the year, missing the two starters here, and probably trying to take it easy with Severino. But they're still going to win a lot of games. So does it take me to a bet on the under? No. But it doesn't take me to a bet on the over, obviously, either. So it makes it an easy stay away for me. And that's what can happen here with these injuries that pop up in spring training. Now, a lot of injuries are going to be soft tissue type things. Gio Gonzalez, Yasmani Grandal, Lucas Giolito, all these guys for the White Sox dealing with some soft tissue stuff. The one that worries me is Gio Gonzalez because he is the older guy. He's a guy that, you know, got off to a late start last season. He went through spring training with the Yankees, didn't get signed for a while, wound up getting signed by the Brewers. But you wonder how he holds up for the full season. Now, Gio Gonzalez is nothing special. He's a, you know, league average, maybe slightly better type of pitcher. But for the White Sox, who don't have good pitching depth, that's a bigger deal to them than it would be to say, the Indians, or the Braves, somebody like that. So Gonzalez is one I'm watching closely, simply because I think his innings are going to be better than the innings of anybody that replaces him. Now, to what degree? Well, that's the question. If he gets replaced by Michael Kopech, it's a little bit different. If Michael Kopech is brought along slowly, coming back from Tommy John, and it winds up being somebody else, well, that's a different discussion altogether. So that's why you follow along with these injuries. It's not just the name recognition of the guys that are hurt. It's the guys that are replacing them as well that you really need to take a a longer look at. One more set of uh, non-injury news, I guess I would say here out of spring training. No innings limits for Jesus Lazardo and A.J. Puck for the Oakland A's. Now, this is important because Daniel Mengden just had arthroscopic surgery on his elbow. He's going to be brought along slowly here throughout spring training. Not that he's great by any means, but Oakland already has a thin starting rotation. They need upside. They need depth. Lazardo and Puck can provide both. Now, of course, those are two guys that have dealt with some major injuries as well. So obviously some concerns there. But the fact that they're not going to be shackled by any innings restrictions improves Oakland's projection to me. Because this starting rotation is the primary concern for the A's. They do get Sean Mania back, who missed almost all of last season. They do still have Mike Fires with his great home splits. But Lazardo's the upside guy. I think Puck is a guy that can be pretty good, too. So that alters the projection for me for Oakland. Now, of course, we'll see if these guys get through spring training healthy. But all of this goes into the equation for me. All of this is part of the process during spring training in terms of how I evaluate and how I look at these injury situations. So... I know, obviously, you're probably not thinking too much baseball right now with basketball still going on, a lot of college basketball, stuff like that. But just try not to lose sight of some of these injury situations that pop up in spring training because a lot of teams will downplay these. And the beat writers by proxy will downplay them as well. You know, because it's going to be, ah, well, he's just being brought along a little bit slowly in camp. Well, being brought along slowly sometimes becomes not pitching in Cactus League games for two or three weeks, which then becomes not ready for opening day, which then becomes something that kind of throws everything out of whack for somebody who's used to preparing for the season. So, again, obviously, I don't expect everyone to be diving into Major League Baseball the way that I am, but just something you want to keep on the back burner here 
kind of want to keep in mind. One last thing to discuss here is this Houston Astros situation. Like I said at the top of the show, this just keeps getting worse before it gets better. Just blatant defiance from the players. Uh, Jim Crane, obviously just completely delusional with the comments that he made during this sham of a press conference on Thursday. And, you know, the players were a little bit more candid once they got back in the locker room and they weren't propped up in front of the media reading prepared statements and this and that. But initially I thought to myself, okay, this is going to be an us against the world situation. This is going to be the Astros players rallying together a big middle finger to everybody else. You know what? We're just going to prove that we can win without doing what we were doing. We're going to prove we can win the world series without stealing signs, without any of this scrutiny, without this, you know, dark shadow, this dark cloud, anything like that. But the more this goes along, the more I wonder, the more I'm not sold on the Houston Astros. First of all, they're going to get everybody's best shot. You know, they're going to have pissed off players from around the league giving them their best shots day in and day out. Now, of course, they did lose Garrett Cole. That certainly made the pitching staff a little bit weaker. You do wonder, of course, too, about the players taking punishment into their own hands because nobody was impressed with what Rob Manfred did. You know, fire uh, gets AJ, Lynch, AJ Hinch removed, gets Jeff Lunau removed. Um, you know, they had the $5 million fine. They lost some draft picks, this and that. But the players that participated in this, the players that knew about it, didn't stop it. By all accounts, didn't really seem to do anything about it. And why would you? You know, until you get caught, who cares, right? Well, the players and their reactions to this are not going over well in the court of public opinion and across Major League Baseball. So Rob Manfred, who is not doing a good job at all whatsoever as commissioner, he may have to step up here. He may have to grow a pair and actually put down some legitimate discipline against Jim Crane, against the Astros players. Now, I don't know if this happens, but the more these guys talk about this and the more that they keep answering questions in such a defiant and haphazard and unconcerned way, just opens them up for more scrutiny. If I'm the Astros, I just shut up. I just let people say whatever. But right now, they're inviting the possibility that Manfred and Major League Baseball come back in on this and actually enforce some punishments against the on-field personnel. I don't know if this happens. I'm just kind of spitballing here. But the more they talk about this, the worse this gets. And you know they hired Dusty Baker to be a shield for the players, to kind of protect the players. They know that this isn't over. And, and they just keep you know, doing things in, in such a manner that I just I don't understand from a player level, from an organizational level. So this Astros situation here, I thought it would be an us against the world mentality. Now I don't know. Now I'm not sure. There may be finger pointing. There may be the assignment of blame. There may be punishments. This may just be a team that, you know what? You're staying in the batter's box and you're ducking because you know 95 is coming at your head. And, and I don't know. I mean, this is such a unique situation. We've never seen this before in the betting era of Major League Baseball. I mean, this, this is this is the steroid era on steroids. And I understand that it involves only one team as opposed to players from around the league. But, I mean, this is crazy. And I don't know how I'm going to handle this team. I don't know how I'm going to handle this team from a season win total standpoint. I don't know what I would do from a division standpoint. Because the tough thing is, they're still the best team in the AL West. They're the most talented team in that division and quite possibly the most talented team in the American League. They're still... Very, very good. A very high upside. But man, this situation just keeps getting worse. And if Major League Baseball decides to move forward and step in now, as maybe Rob Manfred should, just to kind of put his foot down a little bit, what kind of impact does that have? I don't know. It remains to be seen, but it's definitely something that I'll be keeping an eye on here as we get closer to the 2020 Major League Baseball season. So once again, I'll be doing these betters box segments probably on Monday and Thursday as we go forward here a little bit. And then, of course, on Mondays and Thursdays once we get into the Major League Baseball season.